because they're just hanging out at home, that swamped all these other changes. I guess if you think about it, incomes could have increased. Not, just, not because of like how much money people were making, but because they had nothing to spend their money on. Because so many things were shut down, you couldn't go to restaurants, or you can't travel. So many public, like anything you would do in public just wasn't an option anymore. So the share of income you had available to spend on beer, just like Corona, actually increased. Do you guys have any final questions about the supply and demand? We're finally done with the basics of the equilibrium model. Right, so they will start a little bit of chapter six, talk about elasticity, which is basically the responsiveness of supply and demand to changes and things that are going on. We're gonna worry about their responsiveness to change in prices, but there's a few other different things we can look at. <coughs> So just a brief outline of where we're going to be going. We're going to skip uh, sections four and five. Um, I might do like one slide covering the other demand elasticities, but that will just be to illustrate to you guys that there's other like effects going on. It won't be something you're going to have to like memorize or anything. But we'll talk about the price elasticity demand, and we'll talk about how to measure it. Um, we'll go through the process of calculating it. It's not too difficult. Um, it's like a fairly simple equation. Then uh, we'll look at the determinants of the price elasticity of demand and the relationship between the price elasticity of demand and total revenue. And again, that'll be a quick thing, just basically, just to take away the relationship so you guys get that basic understanding, not to really dig in to like calculate things or anything like that. And then finally, we'll look at the price elasticity of supply and its measurement and the determinants that affects the price elasticity of supply. So, so far we've talked about how um, changes in price are gonna affect consumer behavior. Um, now, we, when we looked at the demand curve, we pretty much assumed a slope like this, like 45 degree angle, instead of it being like sharper or being uh, more shallow. So we have this question of how much does the change in price actually affect people? For different goods, it's gonna be different. For some goods, a small price change might substantially affect people's demand, might really increase it or decrease it. Well, on the other hand, some goods people might, 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 might not really care about the price. Instead, they'd be willing to buy just about any price. So a large change won't even have a big effect on the quantity that people demand. So let's say it's like, you know, normal, normal situation, there's no coronavirus across the world. And if you're a bar, you were considering raising your price on Corona beer, you might want to know how consumers are going to respond. If you change, if you raise price by 50 cents for a bottle, are people going to stop buying it? Like most people are going to stop buying it, switch to a different beer? Or does coronavirus fill some sort of need, or not Corona, uh, Corona beer fill the need? And um, because of that, they won't be too responsive to change the price. They'll keep buying it at that higher price. So that brings us to this concept of elasticity. So now, um, some people argue that people don't change the amount of gasoline they buy when price changes. That basically, no matter what you charge for gas, people are gonna still buy it and still buy about the same amount. So do you guys think that's correct? Or do you think people are gonna change their habits you know, based off the change in gas prices? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? All right, so back in uh, 2014, the price of gas dropped from $3.60 a gallon to $2.50 by like the end of the year. So it's a pretty substantial price drop. And gasoline consumption rose by about 7% in response. So people bought about 7% more gas on average. So people do respond to incentives. We had these changing prices um, and they changed 
their actions. But like you said, they don't change very much. Uh, people don't really, I don't want to get into this too much, but people don't change how much gas they buy very much, um, only on the margin, only a little bit here and there. If you think about it, that makes sense. We don't, we're not going to rearrange our lives over what the price of gas is. You still have to drive to work, you still have to drive places. But maybe if, the, if it gets more expensive, you care a little bit more you, about driving, so maybe you do all your errands at once so you don't use up as much gas instead of going out every day. So how can we come up with a sensible way to measure how much quantity changes when price changes? So one basic idea and an easy way to think about it is the slope of the demand curve. That the responsiveness to change of price is just going to be what the slope of this line is. Now when you do it that way, there is a problem. And that problem is the slope depends on the units we use to measure. So if the price is in dollars versus thousands of dollars versus in cents, that's going to change. And if the quantity is if we use the whole number or if we use in thousands or millions, that's going to change the slope. So based off of how you're measuring these things, you can get different answers for what the slope is. That's going to make comparing different goods or even the same good from different people to the problem it's going to make it impossible. So instead of that, we use or we define elasticity as a measure of how much one economic variable responses, responds, how much one economic variable responds to changes in another economic variable based on the percent changes. Because we're using percent changes, there's no units we have to worry about. Um, and if you use the different units, whether it's hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, cents, what have you, the percent change is always going to be the same. So this way it makes it much easier to compare between goods and with different. Um, different units that we're measuring. So the first um, elasticity we're going to look at is the price elasticity of demand. That's the responsiveness of the quantity demanded to a change in price. So how much more are consumers going to want to buy a good um, if we decrease the price a certain amount? So the basic idea it is the price elasticity of demand equals the percent change in the quantity demanded over this percent change in price. So now even though this might seem very similar to slope and they are related, remember it's not the same thing. So you're not just calculating the slope of the um, demand curve here. Um, so for a price increase, uh, the percent change in price is going to be positive, and the percent change in quantity demanded is going to be negative. So when you divide a positive by negative, or vice versa, you end up with a negative number. Likewise, if there's a price decrease, the percent change in price is going to be negative, but the percent change in quantity demanded is going to be positive. Again, you end up with a negative number. Um, your answer is always negative, but when calculating this, or when we compare these, we uh, take the absolute value of the number. So if we end up with negative three, take the absolute value of that, the distance of that number from zero, so it's just positive three. So in essence, you're just dropping the negative, and you compare the positive numbers. So if you have two products, one product has an elasticity of negative three, the other has a price elasticity of demand of negative two, you compare three and two, take the absolute value, positive versions of three and two, and then you compare those. So then the good with the price elasticity of demand of three would end up being more elastic, be the higher one. So that's important to remember that even though the answer is negative, we take the absolute value and we compare positive numbers. So we're talking about a large value for the price elasticity of demand, that means that the quantity demanded by consumers is going to change a lot in response to a price change. Um, we say that demand is elastic, the price elasticity of demand is larger than one. 
or if the absolute value is greater than one. <clears throat> so if there's a 10% increase in the price, and that results in a greater than a 10% decrease in the quantity demanded. So when you have that change of price, you have a larger change in the quantity demanded by consumers. They're more, they're more strongly affected by price, by change in price here. So we're gonna call that elastic. Demand is gonna be inelastic if the price elasticity of demand is smaller, if the absolute value is smaller than one. So it's close to zero. That's indicating that the quantity demanded is gonna change only a little bit in response to a price change. That consumers are willing to buy this good uh, no matter what the price is. So a change in price isn't going to affect them very much. They're still gonna demand the same amount. And there's a thing called unit elastic, which is very rare, but that's if the price elasticity of demand is exactly one. Okay, so for a quick example, um, oh, this whole thing is. Let's look at the price of bagels. Let's say if there's a there's a ten percent increase. In, um, in the price, or, I'm sorry, 10% decrease in the price, there will be a 20% increase in the quality demand. So, price elasticity of demand, very simply, is that. <clears throat> Twenty percent increase divided by the ten percent decrease. Price elasticity of demand is going to be equal to negative two. Take the absolute value of that equal to two. So that's going to be elastic because it's the absolute value is greater than one. Say with the opposite, say if a 10% decrease in price only led to a 5% increase in quantity demanded. So with 5%, that's gonna be negative one half. The answer will be just one half. That's going to be less than one, so the demand will be inelastic. In that case, you see a larger price change results in a smaller change in the quality demanded. All right, how much time do we have left? We've got like 15 minutes left. Um, you guys really don't want to do math today, do you? No. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, before we leave, let's talk about tipping. When you're out to eat at a restaurant or at a bar, you end up tipping. Why do we do that? Is that really? I had no idea where, when yeah, it started. No, really I know the, 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 the tips is like two, is our answer like two extra promise. They used to give it at the beginning to like get like extra good service. But it actually serves a fascinating um, purpose in the market for um, hiring wait staff. So you're looking to hire wait staff, a waiter or a waitress. How do you know if they're going to be good ahead of time? Is, it, is there like a test you can give? Is there like a education that they're going to have? A credential to prove they're going to be good? It's very difficult to tell to hire someone for that. So with 
if you had the company, or the, I guess the restaurant, pay their entire salary, they're gonna be very reluctant to hire someone, especially someone with not much experience. And a lot of young people, a lot of high school or college kids, work as wait staff in order to make money. So what tipping allows is the firm takes, or the restaurant takes a very, like, not much of a chance, because they're only paying, what, like two, three dollars an hour. And then customers pay them based on their quantity or quality. So if you have like really good service, you're going to tip a lot more than someone who does like a bad job. So that way, if they're not good at being a waiter or waitress, they'll end up choosing to leave on their own because they're not making good tips. Whereas the real good ones will be rewarded for that and they'll keep working and they'll stick with it. So what it decreases the risk that um, restaurants have to take and it encourages bad wait staff to leave the profession to go somewhere else where they can just make a, like a consistent wage. And it encourages the good ones to keep working because they keep making huge tips. So even though it seems kind of annoying, it actually serves like a pretty valuable purpose, and especially for like helping the labor market get good wait staff and to keep good wait staff and encourage the bad ones to leave. All right, um, with that, I say let's call it a day 10 minutes early. Enjoy.